In this series of online webinars, I'm going to go through um, the process from sample preparation through to choosing which microscope to use, um, how to acquire the actual images on the microscopes, through to the image processing. Because bioimaging isn't just about getting a pretty picture, we're trying to get numbers out of it. We can actually quantify the image rather than just qualitative, qualitatively look at it. So the first thing you have to think about is, what am I trying to achieve? So if you ask most people what they want their images to look like, it's going to be something like this, where the image is really bright, you have really high contrast, so you have a really black background and a nice clean signal. To achieve that, you've got to make sure that your whole system is right, from the sample preparation through to which microscope you use, through to the acqu acquisition conditions that you, you choose to acquire the images with. So this series is hopefully going to give you a, a starting point to choose the, the right system and the right reagents to hopefully try and give you the best chance of getting the best images that you can. So the thing to remember is image acquisition is still part of your experiment. It's not just the kind of um, the end point that you don't have to think about. You know, most people take time to optimize the transfection, their antibody concentrations, the drug treatments. They'll go through all the process of optimizing the cell density and things like that. And then they just whack it on a cover slip, fix it, shove it under a microscope and expect the picture to be fantastic. It's not that at all. You have to think of the, the microscope as part of the experiment. So you've got to make sure that you're using the best fluorescent tags that you can. Choose the best fixation because not all fixations work equally well for all antibodies and different organelles that you're looking for. Really thinking about what's the most appropriate microscope. You know, we have, we have a whole range of systems from snapshots through to multiphotons. If the confocal was the best microscope for everything, we just have a suite full of my confocal microscopes. We don't, and the reason for that is different microscopes are more appropriate for different experiments and different samples. So please take the time to think about which microscope is going to be best. What's the best imaging conditions? It's not just a simple case of a high magnification objective is the one you want. There are all sorts of things to think about, which is the best laser line, what's the best exposure time and things like that. Because what you have to do is get the appropriate imaging conditions so that you can get some meaningful data at the end of it to do some image processing and some image quantification. So the bioimaging team is, is kind of ever expanding. So there's three facilities now. So there's one on the ground floor in ground floor in Smith, which is staffed by myself, Roger and Steve. There's systems microscopy, which is managed by Dave Spiller. And there's also Darren Thompson, who's over in the CTF facility. So we all have quite extensive microscopy backgrounds. So if you've got any questions about sample prep, what microscope you should use, then that's who you come and see. We're happy to talk through your whole experiment from design through to image processing. So what do we do? Well, we provide access to the cutting edge microscopes to all of the university, um, the faculty, and we have users from across campus. We'll help you design your experiment, help you to design, um, go through the sample prep, give you advice all the way through. We'll then give you one-to-one -one training on the most appropriate system, and we'll give you advice and training as you're going through your imaging experiment. We'll help you on the image processing and the data analysis, and then we get ignored on most publications. So people that are given a drop of antibody often get acknowledged in the papers. For all of the work that we've done on your um, experiment, it'd be nice if we got some acknowledgement. We're not expecting authorship, but to be acknowledged that we um, were involved somewhere from providing assistance on the microscopes. And to make it easy for you, we've actually made cut and paste features. So if you go to the um, bioimaging core facility on the intranet, we have loads of information on here. So if you want to know anything about the microscopes, you can go to the equipment and services, go to the, the microscopes that you've used. And what we have here is a little cut and paste 
that can go into your materials and methods, which describes exactly how you use that microscope. And further down here, we have all of the technical specifications about the microscopes, the filter cubes and things like that. And we also have a little cut and paste for the acknowledgements. So all you have to do is sort of say, these microscopes were actually um, you, part of the bioimaging facility and they were sponsored by grants from the BBSSE Welcome and the University of Manchester. That's all we're asking is just to acknowledge that the microscopes you've used and the work that we've done was part of the, the bioimaging facility. So we often have this problem that people come along and they sort of say, well, you know, our lab's been doing immunofluorescence for years and we've always used the same protocol and the same reagents. You know, hundreds of years ago, people were quite happy using a loom and they were doing it in their, their, their cottage industry. Technology moves forward, you know. Why are you still using the same reagents that you've been using for years, the same dyes? Technology's moved forward. Better reagents have come along, better fluorophores, better secondary antibodies. Why not have a look at some of the reagents out there and decide if actually there's a better way of doing it? Maybe in 20 years, things have advanced a little bit in science. So we often have people sort of having <laughs> the protocol that they use for fixing their samples. So you, you look at it, wash it with PBS, 3.7% PFA, which makes it sound really scientific and really advanced that we've, we've, we must have worked out every concentration of PFA. And 3.7 has been decided that that is the best fixation condition for samples. You're then going to wash it, incubate it in glycine to, to quench the PFA, wash it again, extract your samples with Triton, wash it again, add a primary antibody and incubate it for 30 minutes. Again, very precise, 30 minutes. Wash off the antibody, add a secondary antibody, incubate it for, for again for 30 minutes, wash with PBS again, mount with Prolong and store in four degrees for it, store in the fridge at four degrees. And you've got these things. Never let your sample dry out and work in the dark. So where do these, these kind of protocols come from? Part of it is the working day, you know? So people come in at about nine o'clock and they start to fix their samples and they, they've got to incubate it, gets through to about half past 10 and everybody else in the lab is going for a cup of tea and they're like, oh, you know, I'm doing my immunofluorescence protocol. And somewhere back in time, someone decided, ooh, if I leave it for half an hour in my primary antibody, that'll give me just long enough to go for a cup of tea with everybody else. And it worked. So they've kept with that. So they've kept using this 30-minute incubation. And you have to decide, did I actually need that? Because this is an antibody going into a killed, detergent-extracted open cell. So this 30 minutes is quite an arbitrary value, you know? Maybe five minutes is enough. What you're waiting for is the diffusion of the antibody through the tissue culture cells or the tissue to find that primary um, site for the antibody to bind to. The second anti antibody, 30 minutes. I mean, what, the reason you start to wonder whether this is actually necessary is often in tissue labeling, the primary antibody is left on overnight for uh, at four degrees for an overnight incubation, yet the secondary antibody can travel the same distance through the same tissue at room temperature within 30 minutes. So why is it one antibody takes overnight to reach its epitope, yet the secondary antibody can get to the same point in a room temperature? Probably the reason for that is tissue prep takes a lot longer. So this first incubation, rather than being at half 10 for coffee time, is five o'clock and home time. So people thought, ooh, do you know what? Maybe if I just bobbed it in the fridge, I can leave it overnight and my sample will be fine next morning, I can carry on, rather than having to wait for the whole protocol and I'm not gonna get home till like half past eight at night. I'll stick it in the fridge and incubate it and see what, what happens. It might be that you actually need that long incubation for the primary, but maybe it's not, maybe it's just something that you have to sort of determine by trial and error and see what works. But don't think that this is a fixed protocol that you cannot deviate from. 
you often see people saying, yeah, 30 minutes. A short inc incubation might actually work just as well. Never let your sample dry out and work in the dark. You know, you're hoping to take this primary antibody, th sorry, this sample, and put it under a confocal microscope with a laser focused down 100 times objective onto your sample. If it bleaches in ambient light, there's no chance of you being able to image it under a microscope. So you wouldn't want to work in the dark while you're actually fixing your sample. You don't want to work in a dark room. You know, just keep them out of daylight for prolonged periods of time. The bit of tin foil over the top is normally to stop people knocking it more than the light is actually going to affect your sample. Never let your sample dry out. Mm. We'll come back to that. Okay, there's actually maybe a reason why you would want to let your sample dry out. So but often what people are hoping for when they look down the microscope is something like that, where it's a really bright signal and a really black background. When they look down the microscope, they're like, it's not worked, I've got really high background. What I'll have to do is, is add more antibody, make it brighter. Or, there's nothing there, my signal's just not worked. Actually, each one of these images has the same signal. It's the background that is higher in these ones. So you can't see it because the signal to noise ratio is so poor. So often if you're looking down the microscope and you have high background, the thing that you have to try and do isn't add more signal, it's actually to try and remove the background by more washing, using detergents to try and get the background black. And then actually, your signal is probably strong enough for doing any of the imaging on a confocal or, or a wide field system. So don't just automatically think you have to add more antibody to make it brighter to solve your problem. Normally it's remove the background. So we're gonna grow the cells. And traditionally people come along and they, they grow the cells on glass cover slips and they put them onto a, a slide and that's what they take down to the microscope, a full shoe box full of full of samples. But it turns out that a lot of cells just hate growing on glass cover slips. So what you see on the microscope slide doesn't look like the cells that you were growing in the nice plastic tissue culture flasks. And if that's the case, you're off to a bad start to your experiment anyhow, because your cells just don't look happy. And then you're gonna treat them bad by doing transfections, um, fixing them, doing drug treatments. So you want to, before you even start thinking about the rest of your protocol, make sure your cells on your sample look like they do in the tissue culture flask. And you can actually go down the line of using things like the Abidi labware, which is fantastic. And the cells um, actually love this because it's a polymer cover slip, but the cover slip is still the same thickness as a microscope slide. So you can use these special dishes on um, the confocals, on the wide fields, the cells are happy, the microscope's happy. So it's a win-win situation. So don't just think you have to stick to these traditional glass bottom dishes. There are other options available to you. Blocking steps. So people are obsessed with using um, milk and BSA as the blocking step. Actually, do you need it? Your antibody is meant to be recognizing a specific epitope if you start adding BSA and milk, actually, you might be making things worse. You might be actually introducing um, IgG into the sample, which your secondary antibody then starts to react with. So it's not a good idea to use BSA or dried milk unless you're absolutely sure that there's no cross-reactivity with it. The other thing is, you might find that the antibody that you're using is a little bit dirty. So you need to make sure that you're using really good primary and secondary antibodies that don't react with other things other than the epitope that you're looking at or recognizing other primary or other secondary antibodies. So you've got to make sure that your controls are really good. What you're meant to use is the serum from the host of the secondary antibody. So if you're using donkey um, anti-secondaries, then you should be using donkey serum or we found that another really good substitute is fish skin gelatin, which is just the byproduct of the, the, the fishing industry. But because it's so 
um, far removed from the, the mammalian species, it acts as a really good blocking step. And that just costs pence for that. Whereas donkey serum is actually quite expensive. So it's not just the case of shoving on your antibodies willy-nilly. You have to make sure that your primaries aren't going to react with both secondaries if you're doing multi-labeling um, experiments. So you have to actually make sure that you're using really good primaries and really good secondaries. So there's a good um, website that you can go to which will take you through the whole process of which primaries to use, which different subtypes to use, and also some um, protocols that you can use to go through and make sure that your antibodies aren't going to cross-react with each other. So it's definitely worth having a read through of the Jackson's um, help guide. So when you're looking at primary antibodies, be lazy, you know? Don't just buy an antibody from a catalog that you've not, not got any information on. Be, be lazy a little bit. Who made it? What was it raised against? You know, is it affinity purified? How good is it? So before you, you start doing experiments, spend your time researching the antibodies. Are there any other papers? So you're gonna almost copy somebody because you're wanting to reproduce their, their fantastic results that they've had published. So, you know, go through Google, um, go through the papers to see if there's images. So you know what you're gonna expect when you put it on the microscope. Because you might have just gone to Santa Cruz through their huge catalog and decided that you wanted to look at this, this Golgi matrix protein. You've paid your money and that's the kind of image that you're gonna get. So for the next two or three years, you're using this GM130 antibody and it's giving you this gunk of a stain. Whereas if you'd actually bought an antibody from say Abcam, which was supposedly against the same um, matrix protein, you get a completely different staining pattern to what you would have got if you'd have just used the Santa Cruz antibody. So just because the commercial antibodies and you've had to pay for them, doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get a good antibody from the company. You've got to make sure that you're using um, a well, um, well characterized antibody that's actually been validated for immunofluorescence. So be lazy before you start working too hard. Make sure that the antibody you're going to use is going to give you the results that you're hoping for. And then you've got to be really careful about autofluorescence. It's, it's a constant in immunofluorescence and you've got to work with it and fight against it. So what you're hoping to add is a synthetic fluorophore such as um, Fitzy or all the other dyes that are, are out there. And the reason they fluoresce is because they're an aromatic compound. So the, the electron shells in these aromatic compounds allow energy to, to transfer from one energy shell to the, the other and absorb light and emit light. But the problem is any endogenous proteins or, or compounds that also have these aromatic rings are also able to fluoresce. And they're the sources of the autofluorescence in your sample. And rather inconveniently, most of the, um, the samples that are gonna autofluoresce do it in the visible spectrum, which is exactly where we want to put our synthetic fluorophores to, to use for labeling um, organelles in immunofluorescence. So we're now fighting in the same part of the spectrum for our signal with the autofluorescence signal. So we need to make sure that when we're looking at tissues, particularly tissues, what we're looking at is real. So if you go onto the microscope, and you see a signal and it looks really quite specific, you might go, brilliant, my antibody's working perfectly. Is it, you know? Is what I'm looking at here a real signal or is it autofluorescence? You need to make sure that you do the real controls. So have a tissue sample with no antibody staining on at all. If you then see the same pattern when there's no antibody staining on there, I'm afraid you're just looking at autofluorescence. So we now know that our signal has to be brighter than that, or we have to try and bring down the autofluorescence in the tissue so that we can see our actual staining. And it's possible using 
a very cheap solution such as Sudan Black, or there are commercial um, alternatives out there like Thermo have this tissue autofluorescence, autofluorescence quenching kit. And that can really bring down this autofluorescence signal to almost uh, a background level, which then gives you a much better chance of seeing your, your antibody stains on top of that. So it's really important that when you start doing any immunofluorescence, you do the no antibody controls to make sure that what you're looking at, which might often look really specific, isn't just an autofluorescence stain. So we're going to go along and think of this strategy of how are we actually going to um, label our samples. We could just go along with a direct primary antibody that's already got a fluorescence uh, fluorophore attached to it. And all we then do is chuck on our primary antibody, it's going to stick to the epitope and we can visualize that via immunofluorescence, a direct one step label and view. Traditionally, um, or quite, quite commonly, um, we use a two-step antibody strategy where you go in with your primary antibody, which is unlabeled, and then you'll go in with a secondary antibody that is labeled. So we might start off with a mouse antibody against our epitope, and then we'll use a donkey anti-mouse labeled secondary. What's nice about that is we get an amplification of the signal so we can have more antibodies binding to the primary that are labeled so we get a brighter signal. And we can use this lab secondary labeled antibody on lots of things. So any other mouse primary antibody, we can label those as well with the, the, um, the anti-mouse secondary. The problem is we can start to get more cross reactivity because these secondaries might recognize other primaries um, that then start to need blocking to, to kind of avoid this cross reactivity. If your signal's weak, rather than trying to add more antibody and trying to make it brighter and struggling with exposure time, you might want to start thinking about some different techniques to amplify the signal. So it's possible to go in with your primary antibody and rather than using whole, um, whole antibody secondaries, you can actually use digested fragments so you can kind of um, go in with the next secondary and then you can go in with fragments to the, to the secondary to amplify that even more or FAB fragments to the, to the primary. So we're able to amplify step again. And you can read it, that in the, the Jackson Immuno um, guide. Another technique that's, that's come along quite recently is using a tyramide amplification step. And that's a bit more like a, an enzyme reaction where you would come in with your primary antibody as normal. You'd then come in with your secondary, which has this um, tyramide enzyme. And what that does is it sort of deposits fluorophore around it. So you have a massive amplification step. What you're then able to do is basically wash off that um, tyramide amplification step and you could then come in with a different antibody with a different secondary um, amplification in a different color. So you don't have any cross reactivity because that first antibody has been washed away and you get massive amplification. So it's not a case of the only thing I can do in immunofluorescence is this two step strategy. If you start to run out of species, then going to a primary labeled antibody is a really good strategy. So if you've got a strong, a strong signal, work with, work with that. And your weaker signal could be used with the, the two-step or the, the amplification methods. So when you're choosing your secondary antibody, you have to be really careful about what dyes am I going to use? You know, we traditionally think of dyes like Fitzy or Tritzy. And when we say that, everybody knows exactly what colour we're talking about. So if I said to someone in the Fitzy channel, they know instantly that we're talking about a green dye. But this is the 100 years old. It's an old dye. It's not that bright. It's not that stable. Maybe you should start thinking about some other dyes like the Alexa 488, which has exactly the same spectrum, 
um, spectral properties as Fitzy, but is new and much better to do to go with. So don't stick to the old dyes like Fitzy and Tritzy. Move over to the Alexa dyes. It doesn't cost any more. You're just going to benefit from doing it. The other problem you have in the blue end and the green end is that tends to be where the autofluorescence is. So if you're using tissue and you have a problem with that, not only trying to suppress it using the Sudan Black or the quenching kits, but also moving towards the red spectrum all the way through to Psi 5 and Psi 7. The downside of here, you can't see it by eye, but the, the cameras and the detectors on the confocal can still visualize these. So not all fluorophores have the same brightness or photostability. So when you're choosing which secondaries to use or which, which um, fluorophores to use, you have to be quite careful that, you know, they might initially be brighter if we were gonna use the Alexa 546, but actually they bleach pretty quickly. So by the time you focused on it or you're imaging it on a confocal, it's not great, whereas, the Alexa 555, slightly dimmer initial brightness, but very, very photostable. So out of the two dyes, actually the 555 would be a much better alternative to, to Psi 3 or Tritzy than the, the 546. Or move to something like the Alexa 594. Really bright, still stable, and really stable in anti-fade. So don't just assume you've only got one choice in the Alexa dyes. Do we need to use an anti-fade? Yes. Pretty much everything you're going to do, the better your sample prep and the better your protection of your fluorescence, the easier your image acquisition is going to be and the more comparable your results are going to be from sample to sample. So if you look at like Fitzy fluorescein, it bleaches incredibly quickly when it's unprotected. So the brightness of your sample that you're, you're going to image is actually a function of how long you took to focus on it. So if you were imaging it on the confocal and you were taking quite a few seconds to, to actually focus on your sample, it could be about a, a kind of a fifth of the brightness that it started off at. Whereas your next sample, you might focus on it quicker and it now looks brighter. But that was nothing to do with the staining um, efficiency. It's just a function of the time it took you to look at it. So here it is, we, if we're using an anti-fade. So initially, it'd be bleaching before your eyes. So very quickly, it's gone. If you do it in prolonged gold or prolonged diamond, actually your signal stays there much better, giving you a much better chance of imaging it on the confocal or the deconvolution systems. But you have to be careful which anti-fade you actually use. So um, Thermo have prolonged gold and prolonged diamond. It's fine if you're using either of these for, for the Alexa dyes, but if you were actually trying to label some of your samples with fluorescent proteins, actually prolonged gold isn't great for, for the um, fluorescent proteins. You'd want to be moving over to the prolonged diamond. It's the same price, just a different formulation. So moving on to these modern um, reagents, again, is going to be of benefit to you. So why don't we want our sample to dry out? Yet, actually, as I was saying before, you do want your sample to dry out. So if you imagine you're trying to label a, a microtubule or, or some other structure like that, and you're going to go in with your primary antibody, and you're going to go in with your secondary antibody with its fluorescent probe attached to it. The problem comes if you have a lot of water around your sample, what can happen if you shine a light, a high light intensity source onto it, such as a laser or the, the, um, the light down 100 times objective, that water can be cleaved and you get oxygen free radicals produced. And it's these oxygen free radicals that actually attack the, um, the fluorescent system, the, the, um, the electrons, moving up and down through the energy shells and emitting light. So your antibody isn't cleaved or your fluorophore isn't cleaved, it just stops glowing. So it's now a bleached fluorophore. So you'd want your antifade 
to stop that. And a lot of what antifades do is sequestering away these oxygen-free radicals. So as they're produced, they're sequestered away and taken out of the system so that your, your fluorophore is protected. But if you don't let your sample dry out, actually, around your antibodies, you've still got water. So even though you've now got antifade, you've still got water around your sample, and it's a diffusion gradient, and it all looks pretty crap. So what do you want to do? You want to get rid of that water by letting your sample dry out, but you don't want to let your sample dry out. And the reason you don't want to let your sample dry out during normal um, sample prep is you're washing in PBS. If you let that dry out, you'll get salt crystal formation, and that'll actually start to kind of destroy your tissue. All you have to do at the end of your protocol, dip your sample into some water or wash it with some water, wash off the PBS. Now you can let the sample dry out to drive off the water. Then when it's dry, add your antifade and your fluorophore is protected in the antifade with no water in the system anymore. So you might have actually seen this if you've used the, the microscopes um, before. So if we were going to look down a microscope at a cover slip, normally people aren't that good at labeling, uh, at mounting the samples. So what you often have are air bubbles. So if we go around and we look in the, the microscope, you go, oh, mm, oh my sample, it's, it's got quite a lot of background. What I'll do is I'll add more antibody next time. Yeah, that's not it. We want to drop the background. Yeah, it's not working. Oh, look at the cells in that air bubble. Oh, they're really bright and there's a really black background, you know, absolutely fantastic contrast. But because they're not, because they're in the air bubble, I'm not going to image them. I'm going to go back to these other rubbishy ones where actually, what is it that's not in this air bubble? That cover slip was fixed at the same time, labeled at the same time processed all the way through. The only difference about this air bubble about compared to the rest of the sample is it's not in the mountain. And in that mountain, if we didn't let it dry out completely, there would have been water. Whereas in this air bubble, there's no water. So your whole cover slip, if we'd have let it dry out, would have actually looked more like the cells in this air bubble, apart from, you know, they're now in an air rather than a, a mountain. So let your sample dry out and you've got a much better chance of having a bright, high contrast sample. Cover slips, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes. And most times what you're going to think about is what shape you want. That's probably the least important part of a cover slip. If you look at the objectives, they all tell you, and this is what most people think about, it's like, ooh, what? What magnification do I want? Do I want a 40 or a 63 or a 100? The objectives are telling you a huge amount of information about what they can do and what they want you to do. So you can see all along here, these have the ability to image oil, glycerol water. This has a correction collar on it. This one has a correction collar on it. This one doesn't, okay? So what these are all telling you here are the thickness of the cover slip that that objective is expecting or can work with. In the case of this one, you have no correction collar, so it's expecting a 0.17 millimeter thick cover slip, which is a number 1.5. This objective has a slight correction collar. This one can go from 0.15 millimeters up to 0.19 millimeters. This one can't. So it's expecting exactly oh, 0.17 millimeter thick cover slip. And you might go to uh, manufacturer A and it's a number one, plus or minus 0.01 millimeters. Not the right objective, sorry, not the right cover slip for your sample. It needs to be a number 1.5. So if you use this microscope cover slip, on our, on our microscope, it's like looking through the wrong pair of glasses. You'll get an image, but it won't be quite right. Whereas if you go and find, ah, you know, a number 1.5 cover slip, it's the right thickness. But not all cover slips are the same. So how close to 0.17 millimeters is it? 
you might find um, you buy them from a cheap manufacturer, this could be a much bigger gap. So you have real variation in the thickness of the cover slip. If you buy them from Marion Feld, they might cost 20p for a cover slip, but you know that this is absolutely perfect cover slip to use with the microscope systems. So, you know, thinking of the cost of the cover slip, 20p, whew, now I'm going to use a cheap 3p one. Well, your primary antibody that you've just used might have cost £120 for the, for the tube, of which you only get a 20, 30 cover slips out of. You're then going to go onto the confocal microscope and pay £25 for the privilege of using that per hour. The cost of a cover slip is trivial in comparison. So make sure the cover slip that you're using is the right thickness, or if you're using an objective with a correction collar, you adjust that correction collar to match the cover slip thickness. Mounting your sample. Okay, these are the, the take home messages. Never let your sample dry out. Well, no. Actually, you want to let your sample dry out once you've washed off that PBS so that the salt crystals can't form. Once you've um, wash that off, you want to let it dry, your sample's dead, it's fixed, it's not going to go anywhere, but that makes it a much better um, sample prep, that your sample's going to, your fluorescence will, will be brighter for longer without that water in the system. Use a mountain with an anti-fade reagent, use a really high quality cover slip of the right thickness, and use a hard setting mountain like the Prolong um, diamond or the Prolong glass. If it's hard set, that means you don't need to go around it with the, the nail polish. You just let them set. But if you are going to let them set, they need to polymerize at room temperature before you move them to the fridge. And you need to make sure that you leave them flat to polymerize. Otherwise, this could happen to your sample. So this is someone that mounted them in a, in a hard set mountain, but put them straight into the slide box and then let them set. They're now stuck in that box. So when they drop them off at the microscope suite, there's nothing we can do with them. We had to just call them up and say, come back and get your slides. You're gonna to have to try and peel them out of the box without breaking them. So the, the next question is, do you even need an antibody? The protocol that you're using, you're wanting to label um, specific organelles. Maybe there are other ways of doing it because you can quite quickly run out of stains by using a, a multiple antibody label strategy. So, you know, maybe you can watch your sample in a living cell rather than fixing it and seeing a snapshot of what your cell's doing. If you're using a live stain or a, a, a fluorescent protein, you can follow the dynamics of that through the sample. You can then, there's a whole range of different stains that you can use that will just label the organelles directly. And you can use virus-based plasmids rather than just um, a, a, a fluorescently labeled dye. Very high efficiency. You just use it as a commercial solution, but know that you're gonna have pretty much 100% um, transfection, uh, transfection efficiency. And you can go to tools to choose how that's going to work. So Thermo have the ability to sort of say, okay, what, what would I like to label? So if we want to have a look at um, cytoskeleton, so we're going to have a look at tubulin, and I'm going to label that in green. Okay, um, let's see what that would look like. Okay, so I've got my live stain that I can I use on that. What else do I want to look at? I'm going to label mitochondria in orangey red. I could use that one. And maybe I'll even use the plasma membrane in a deep red stain um, that works on fixed as well. So that's three proteins that we're labeling up without using a single antibody in those. So they're using um, stains and transfection reagents, which will be... 100% transfection reagent, uh, transfection efficiency, and the stain. And that would also then leave me, potentially, other options of using antibodies to label my protein of interest, while the cytoskeletal proteins that I'm interested in following as well are labeled in a different strategy. 
So it's not all antibody, antibody, antibody. There are other tools out there. So transient transfections or a stable cell line. If you're trying to follow a protein over and over, rather than every time having to do a transient transfection or using the, the, the virus method, potentially it's a good idea to actually make yourself a stable cell line so you know what your cells are going to look like fluorescently labelled every time. So there are cell lines available that you can buy and it's not that difficult to actually make a stable cell line. Especially if you're at the beginning of your project, it's going to save you so much time and effort in the long run. It doesn't have to be just green. There's the whole family of living colours available to you. So you can la label different proteins in different colours that we can then visualise on the confocals downstairs. But, again, not all of the fluorescent proteins are the same. If your lab's been using GFP for the past 20 years, there are other fluorescent proteins out there which are brighter, more photostable, mature quicker, and are actual monomers. So it's sometimes worth thinking about what plasmids you're using and whether it's actually worth going back to the drawing board and doing a, a small bit of molecular biology to get a better fluorescent protein in there. So you can go to these interactive fluorescent protein charts and you might say, okay, I want to choose something that's really bright and matures really quickly. What are my, what are my options? So we've got something really bright, something really, um, really long maturation, such as DS Red. So you've got to think about is that really what I wanted to have? Something that takes so long to mature? Um, what about stability? You know? So this is this is really um, really bright and not that bad a, a, a bleaching time. So M neon green is a fantastic fluorescent protein, has exactly the same spectral characteristics as um, like GFP, so you'd be able to use all the same filter sets and laser lines but it's much brighter than GFP and it's actually really stable. So moving between different um, proteins will actually help you when you come to do live cell imaging. Once you have these fluorescent proteins, it's possible to then follow cells in a dynamic sense and see where these proteins are going, see what the, the drug treatments have on living cells and see the actual cytoskeleton um, at the same time. So sample prep is really important before we've even taken it to the microscope to choose which one is the most appropriate microscope. Getting your sample prep right is going to make a massive difference to how well your samples look down the microscope. A well-labeled a well sample is easy to image. If your sample's rubbish, it's really hard no matter how expensive a microscope we go on. If your signal's rubbish, we can't really do much with it. So getting these first steps right is really important. This web links are all of the, the, the pages that I've kind of gone through. So it's worth having a look at these um, later. And in the, the next webinar, we're going to talk about how the actual different microscope systems work. So I hope you found this first part useful.